What's going on all of my healthcare brothers and sisters? I hope that you are having a wonderful day. My goal on this channel is to help you pass your NCLEX as well as your nursing exams like a boss. And today we're gonna to be discussing hyperkalemia. Let's get our electrolyte on. So in order to understand what hypokalemia is, we need to know what potassium is. So what's a normal range for potassium? Well, it's 3.5 to 5 milli equivalents per liter. And the main functions of potassium is it is the most abundant intracellular cation. It is a positively charged ion. It transmits electrical impulses. It also helps with our acid-base balances when it comes to hydrogen and potassium. They're both positively charged ions and they balance each other out. So they can both be found in the cell and outside of our cells. If we have an increase in potassium in our cell, then hydrogen is going to move out. Whereas if we have increased hydrogen in our cells, then potassium is going to move out. They help balance each other out. It's a beautiful relationship that they have. A major, they have a major role in heart and skeletal muscle contractions. It helps maintain heart and muscle contraction as well as regulate our kidneys and it also helps influence our aldosterone. So it's important to note that with every 0.1 decrease in pH, we will have a 0.5 increase in potassium. That's that balance that we were talking about with our hydrogen and our potassium. So as our pH is decreasing, our potassium is going to start becoming heavily elevated. So now that we know what potassium is, we need to understand what hyperkalemia is. Well, it's high potassium in the blood, so it's a range greater than five milli equivalents per liter. You can have a pseudo hyperkalemia, which is a condition that can occur due to uh, methods of blood smespin collection and cell lysis. If an increased serum value is obtained in the absence of any other kind of clinical symptom, I highly recommend that you redraw that specimen and reevaluate to make sure that that is a accurate potassium. Because if blood is drawn too quickly, a lot of times these cells can burst and all of that excessive potassium can get into your lab specimens. So again, just make sure that you're monitoring it. If you do have hyperkalemia in the absence of any kind of um, clinical um, conditions. So what are some causes of hyperkalemia? Well, we have excessive potassium intake. Over ingestion of potassium containing foods or medicines can cause that hyperkalemia. Those things could be potassium chloride or even salt substitutes is a big one. A lot of people uh, try to replace our regular salt with salt substitutes and that can actually increase your potassium. Decreased potassium excretion. So when we have um, potassium sparing or retaining diuretics such as spirolactone, that's actually going to cause potassium to be kept as opposed to excreted out. Um, kidney disease is another one. Renal failure causes a decrease in urination and an increase in serum potassium. And adrenal insufficiency such as with our Addison's disease patients. So potassium levels will climb due to not having enough potassium excretion from those low aldosterone levels. So additional causes can be movement of potassium from the intracellular fluid to the extracellular fluid, um, such as tissue damage and burns is a big one that causes cells to die and burst, that lysis we talked about, um, releasing all of that potassium from the cells. You have acidosis, so you've got that hydrogen and potassium relationship. They're both located within the side of the cell. With acidosis, there's gonna be an abundant amount of hydrogen in the blood vessel, causing hydrogen to shift into the cell. Well, if hydrogen is shifting into the cell, the potassium is going to shift out of the cell to help maintain that relationship between these two ions. You could also see it with hyperuricemia um, as well as hypercatabolism as well. A couple of our last few causes can be diabetic ketoacidosis like we talked about before with our acidosis. Insulin plays a major role in getting potassium into the cell. Without enough insulin, that potassium stays within the blood vessel causing hyperkalemia. Um, also the acidosis causes that hydrogen shifting within the cells to increase the potassium in the blood vessels. So if we've got more hydrogen moving into our cells, we're gonna have more potassium coming out, causing hyperkalemia. 
Um, dehydration and infection is another big one. Um, dying tissues and cells release potassium into the bloodstream. So pretty much if you have any kind of cell death or lysis of your cells, you're going to see an increase in your potassium levels. Lastly, medications. Um, ACE inhibitors, specifically your prills, will cause hyperkalemia. Spirolactone, remember it's a uh, potassium sparing diuretic, as well as many NSAIDs will cause your serum potassium to increase. So if we've got this excessive potassium inside of our blood vessels, then our patients are going to present a little bit differently than when we have hypokalemia. So everything in the body when it comes to hyperkalemia is going to be tight and contracted. There's a lot of potassium, everything is contracting, 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 it becomes tight. So that's what you wanna think about with our hyperactive potassiums, or hyperkalemia, think hyperactive, tight and contracted. So when it comes to the cardiovascular system, we're going to see slow, weak, irregular heart rates, decreased blood pressures, and this time you're going to see a lot of bradycardia is occurring, as well as dysrhythmias. Any kind of electrolyte change, you're probably going to see something happening with your EKG. When it comes to your respiratory system, we are going to have profound, remember this is a late sign, profound weakness of the skeletal muscle resulting in respiratory um, failure. If everything is tight and contracted and we're having this profound weakness because of this um, irregularity in our potassium, then we're going to have respiratory failure. When it comes to neuromuscular system, early on you're going to see muscle twitching, cramps, tingling and burning, um, followed by numbness in your hands and your feet, especially around your mouth. And then as we move further into hyperkalemia, we're going to have those profound, remember profound is late, profound weaknesses, paralysis of the arms and the legs, as well as potentially your trunk, head, and respiratory muscles are going to become affected um, when the serum potassium levels reach a lethal level inside of the blood vessel. So when it comes to our gastrointestinal system, remember again we are tight and contracted. So you're going to have a hyperactive GI system. We're going to have increased motility as well as those hyperactive bowel sounds. And these patients are going to have massive amounts of diarrhea. They're going to, it's when we have hypokalemia, we have constipation, and we have hyperkalemia, they're just they're pooping and they can't stop. When it comes to laboratory findings, again, serum potassium levels are going to be greater than 5 milliequivalents per liter. And when it comes to our electrocardiogram changes, we have to remember they're tight and contracted, so our ECG is going to be hyperactive. So our ST elevations are going to be seen. You're going to see those tall peaked T waves. You're going to have flat P waves, widened QRSs, prolonged PR intervals, and you can also see ventricular fibrillation or cardiac standstill, which is also known as asystole, occurring when we have severely high potassium levels of heart being treated. And again, when it comes to um, hyperkalemia, when it's on your NCLEX, if you hear profound and severe, these are late and serious signs. So let's talk about hyperkalemic interventions. The first being monitoring cardiac rhythm changes. Because as we spoke about before, hyperkalemia is going to cause tight and contracted. So we want to make sure that we watch our ECG because it's going to be hyperactive. Tight and contracted, your ECG will be hyperactive. So you want to make sure that we're monitoring for those ECG changes. We're going to initiate a potassium restricted diet. So we want to avoid those potassium rich foods such as banana, avocado, kale, green leafy vegetables, and we especially want to avoid those salt substitutes because they're very high in potassium that will make that hyperkalemia worse. When it comes to potassium decreasing medications, we have quite a few that we can choose from. Um, we can use potassium wasting diuretics that will help get rid of those um, excess potassium through the urine. That can be with either our loop diuretics such as our Lasix as well as our thiazides. We also have K-exalate. K-exalate is also known as sodium polystyrene sulfonate. So something that's important to know when it comes to your NCLEX is they're not going to be giving you brand named medications. You won't see KXLate on the NCLEX, but you will see the generic name. So when it comes to KXLate, it's going to help us get rid of potassium in the stool. So you're going to see this explosive diarrhea after the administration of KXLate because it's just something, it's a side effect and it's what KXLate does. 
We can also give IV calcium gluconate if the hyperkalemia um, kalemia is extremely severe. This helps avert myocardial excitability and muscular irritability. Um, we can also give regular insulin and hypertonic glucose such as D50 IV to move po excess potassium into the cells. We talked about that a little bit earlier. Um, albuterol is something that I've seen too. A lot of people are like, oh, albuterol? What does that have to do with hyperkalemia? Well, it can actually drive potassium into the cell temporarily. So it gives you a little bit of a leeway time when it comes to other treatments kind of getting to their peak effects. And lastly, bicarb. We talked about that relationship between hydrogen and potassium. So with bicarb, it counteracts that acidosis and allows potassium to get back into the cell. So if we're giving bicarb, what it's going to do is it's going to pull hydrogen from the cell. If we're having that excess hydrogen within our extravascular space, what's going to happen to our potassium? Well, it's going to go right back into our cells because they have to balance each other out. That's how they balance each other out. So with sodium um, bicarbonate, it's really a great option to help um, with hyperkalemia as well if we're having an acidosis also present. Dialysis can help clean the blood. That's a big one. If um, the patient's kidneys are not working appropriately and aren't unable to excrete potassium, dialysis could be an option. And lastly, we want to be very careful with the administration of blood products. So when it comes to blood transfusions, specifically stored blood transfusions, not fresh blood transfusions, blood transfusions that have been there for a little bit, um, it can elevate potassium levels because of the breakdown of older cells in the back. So if you have a stored blood transfusion, as we know, cells can become damaged and they can um, break apart. So if they break apart, what's inside that cell is going to come out into the blood products. So you're going to have an increase in that potassium within your blood product. So it's really best to use fresh blood as opposed to stored blood because there's less likely um, a possibility that potassium is going to be higher in that fresh blood than it will in that stored blood. I hope that this video was helpful for you in passing your nursing exams like a boss. If you have any questions, please feel free to leave them down below. I love answering your questions. Make sure that you follow me on my social media. I'm on Facebook, Instagram, and Twitter, as well as here on YouTube. Make sure that you subscribe as well as like this video. I also have a website at www.nursechung.com where I will have NCLEX style questions as well as additional resources with each of my videos. So make sure that you check that out. But until next time, I hope that you're having a wonderful day and I will speak with you all again soon. Bye.